Today, we're closing down this series called Celebrate. And I'm excited because this is like such a good message. And I don't even know the full extent of it. It's going to be so great. And one of my best friends gets to preach it today. Would you guys stand to your feet and really welcome my friend, Corey Aspan, to the stage. funny I don't get nervous about a whole lot and I love the word of God and yet when I get up here I get a little nervous and get little pits in my stomach and uh, it's funny because I've been here for a while I've gotten I've been blessed to baptize some of our youth kids I ran our youth ministry for the last three and a half almost four years I run our tech team um, get to help with worship that way and get to do stuff and yet I still get up here and put this mic in my hand and I get really really nervous <laughs> so like Adam said, my name is Corey. I've been here for a while. And one of the things is that me and Adam have been friends for a while. And uh, when we were contemplating moving here uh, to help launch Blueprint Church, well, we, at the time we weren't contemplating. We had decided it was done deal. But we were here on our last day visiting here. And we went out to dinner with Chelsea and Adam. And we're sitting at the table with Adam. And I'm talking to him. And I'm like, man, not much gets me upset. But, and he cuts me off immediately. And he goes, oh, my, who are you trying to kid? Everything gets you upset right? It gets me fired up. So I, I, I get upset about a lot of things. And one of the things I get upset about a lot is in movies and books, there is a whole class of people whose job it is called editors to make sure there's not mistakes, to make sure there's not continuing errors that go from book to book or from movie to movie. And yet all the time they fail miserably, like miserably. And the most recent, like, application of this that I can give you that might be the most relevant, because um, there's a lot better ones, but this one's just the most relevant. Anybody watch Cobra Kai on Netflix? Okay. Anybody seen The Karate Kid? Okay. So if you've seen The Karate Kid, there's this new show called Cobra Kai, and it's like them 30 years after the fact, and they're opening up their own new dojos and all this stuff. And one of the things that Cobra Kai always does they refer back to the old movies and they just show the clip from the movie every time there's like a, a flashback they they go back to it and when they go back to it every time they show Daniel LaRusso doing the famous crane kick you know and kicking Johnny Lawrence right in the face to win the tournament Cobra Kai even doubles down and says when Johnny LaRusso actually is talking to him or Daniel LaRusso is talking to Johnny Lawrence he says I kicked you in the face. How did it feel? Like, he's like, he says something to that effect. Like, he makes sure that you know he kicked him in the face. But if you go back and watch The Karate Kid, because it fit the narrative of the moment, the bad guys were warned multiple times about kicking people in the face, that they would be disqualified if they kicked somebody in the face. And then he turns around, and for the winning point, kicks him in the face. Everybody celebrates. But it doesn't fit what would have really happened if that was realistic. And editors are supposed to keep this from happening, but they fail miserably. And I say this because one of my great fascinations with Scripture is God's perfection not to miss details. Okay, and when I say don't miss details, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of great ones where he, he makes a reference in this book, and in this book he references back to it with perfect, like never missing a beat of what happened. But I'm going to give you three specific ones, okay? So in Genesis... Uh, Abraham takes his son Isaac up to the altar to sacrifice him. God says, you know, sacrifice your son. So he goes up and he tests him in this to see if he'd really do it. And when he gets there, Abraham, Isaac says to his son, oh, dad, where's our, where's our sacrifice? And he goes, the Lord will provide one. But he, he knew what the call was. It was to sacrifice his son. But when he gets there, he says, Abraham, stop. And when Abraham looks, he sees a ram caught in a thicket. Okay, in John's gospel, there are seven I am statements, but John only counts two or three of them for you. He lets you count those, okay? And then the third one is the five smooth stones picked up by David. Now, the ram caught in the thicket, the best part about this is a baby ram is a lamb. A thicket would be a bush of thorns and it's caught on his head. Does anybody see the symbolism there, Right? Okay, so next one, seven I am statements in John. He, there's three sets of seven where Jesus says, I am something, and it comes down. There's three sets of seven different statements throughout this thing. It's perfect, okay? 
But this last one is one of my particular favorites. I mean, I have, when I first read it, I noticed it, and I was like, why is that? Why did he grab five? And so let's start here. So David is coming up to battle Goliath. And David tells Goliath, right? He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat you, but he's not wearing any armor. That's some serious faith. David says, I'm going to cut off your head. David doesn't have a sword on him. He's not even carrying one. So that's faith, right? That takes faith to know that he's going to go out and do what he said he's going to do. Now, he knows he doesn't need the armor, and he knows he's going to use Goliath's own sword to cut off his head. But what's interesting is when he gets ready to battle, he leans down and he grabs five smooth stones. Now, on instinct, every person reading that just dismisses this detail and goes, well, he probably thought he was going to miss. Got to make sure I got plenty, Right? Let me look this up because I want to make sure I don't want to get my notes. I don't want to make sure I missed the wrong verse. So, in Second and First Chronicles twenty, David and his mighty men of valor are battling people from Gath, and they slay four brothers of Goliath. So I venture to in the details of what you read in Scripture that the answer was there. We just didn't see it because we couldn't see what David saw. But the Bible answers very clearly why he picked up five stones. Because like any assumption, if anybody who's ever been to a fight or a battle or anything, he assumed if he killed Goliath, he probably was going to have to kill his brothers too. But this is perfect. God doesn't miss that detail. He even answers it for you. Well, why did he pick up five stones? I'm, I'm so fascinated with this because the word of God is so perfect. Ancient Hebrew scholars would tell you that the word of God is like a diamond. That if you turn it or you look at it from a different angle, there's just another beautiful characteristic you see there. But anybody who's ever read the Bible multiple times knows that every time you read it, you see something new. There's a detail you missed. There's something that's cool. And then when you start to study and you learn things, and so one of the things we're going to talk about today is the Hebrew wedding tradition because it's mentioned throughout the Bible, but it's never specifically talked about in a way that's like, here's this, God said do this. But it's there and it plays out throughout the course of Jesus' ministry. So, this first word, and I'm going to try to say it as good as I can, because I'm Middle Eastern, and even I struggle with saying some of these words. The first one is shirchen. So shirchen is the preliminary arrangement of marriage. Okay? So what this is, is that the father of the groom-to-be would send out either himself or a representative to go find his son a bride, okay? And this is like very much kind of similar to what we would understand as an arranged marriage, except for that there was some key details that are different. We're going to get into those. But specifically, we're going to look at the example of this in Scripture. The example of this in Scripture is from Genesis with Abraham, and he says this. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son, Isaac. So this is the first part. The father arranges the marriage for his son. This was customary in ancient Hebrew. The son didn't go find himself a wife. The father did it for him. He was busy serving his father. Sound like anybody else? Um, so the next part is the ketubah. Now, that one's an easy one to say, ketubah. Now, the funny thing about this is maybe that's not how they said it in ancient Hebrew, but that is still the word they use today for a Hebrew wedding. It's the wedding contract, okay? And so this word carries a lot of connotation. There's provisions for marriage. There's a promise from the husband to love his wife and what he's going to do for her. All these things are stipulated in the ketubah, Okay? And so we see the ketubah, it says this, it says in Genesis 24, and it came, because there was a dowry involved, and it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words, this is him now talking to uh, Rebekah's parents, and that he had worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, and then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. This wedding dowry mostly belonged to the bride. Now we know in like two, three hundred years ago, the wedding dowry belonged to the parents of the bride. But now in this Hebrew wedding tradition, it belonged to the bride. There's a reason why. 
Okay, and we're going to get into that as we keep going through. We're going to get into why that's important. But there was also an important stipulation in the ketubah. Unlike what we would understand as a modern arranged marriage, the ketubah was dependent on the bride choosing to enter into that marriage. Not her parents, not anybody else. Her authority to say, yes, I want to be married or no, resided with her, not with anybody else. Which is strange because in that culture, the father ruled over everything in his house. But there was a stipulation the bride had to be willing to go. And we even see this because in Genesis, we see Abraham's servant just a few verses before what we just read. He says this. He says, perhaps the woman will not be willing to, fo to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? So very importantly, the bride was going to make the decision and the bride had everything to do with yes or no. Okay. So the next part of this thing, of this process, is called the mohar, or morham. That's how you would say it in Hebrew. They still use that term modern again. That's how they say it, but that's how they would have said it. That's how it was said when I Googled it, because some of these words, I see them in English, but I wanted to learn them in Hebrew for the effect of you understanding how important sometimes these things are. So this is known as the bride price, okay? This is... This bride price, this, this dowry we talked about, belonged to the bride, and it set her free from her family. It's going to be an important detail later when we talk about Jesus' ministry in the church. So let's keep moving on. So we've seen this in Genesis. We saw what we just talked about, but also Genesis 29, 20. We see this with Isaac and his wife to be Rachel and Leah. It says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. He had to serve seven years to free her from her parents. Now, if you know that story, they give him Leah, and then he serves another seven years for Rachel still. So he gets tricked, but he was the trickster, so it was kind of turnabout play kind of thing in the Bible. You know how God's got a sense of humor like that. He had tricked his brother and done all this stuff, and now somebody played a trick on him, and it's, it's full circle. But we'll, we'll just kind of move on from that a little bit. But so the next step, and this is the one that Adam talked about when we talked about the, the clean pots that Jesus would have done this water into wine. When we talked about the very first week of Celebrate, we talked about this was his first miracle and it was at a wedding, right? And, Jesus, and uh, Adam was talking about these pots that they would have used would have been cleaned and they would have been used for what was called the mikveh. And the mikveh was a ritual immersion individually done by both the bride and the groom. They would get their whole body cleaned by a rabbi. It was to symbolize a spiritual cleansing, and it was a physical cleansing, okay? This was something they did before they actually get married. So this is very important. So now we're moving on. We're almost, we're almost to the wedding time now, but we're not there yet, right? Because in any modern wedding, we know, like some people we know recently got engaged. So people would get engaged or get betrothed, is where they would use. So the next step is called irusin. Irusin is the betrothal. But in Hebrew tradition, it was legally binding. Only the husband could get a divorce. But it was the minute they entered into this betrothal, they were married. It was done. Okay? But there's a lot of parts that go into this. So we see this with Mary and Joseph. We see the law says this in Deuteronomy 24, one through four, but when we see it illustrated in Matthew 119, it says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So when he finds out that his wife Mary is pre pregnant with Jesus, Joseph has a mind to put her away quietly. He doesn't want this to be a public divorce because this was legally binding. Everybody would know they had been married, even though they had not had any relations yet. And there's a reason why we're going to see how that was. Okay, so during the Irusin, after they had done the mikvah, after they had done the whole arranging the marriage and everything, the groom and his party would set up what was called a chuppah, or some people have said it in TV shows, chuppah, but it's a giant tent, which is where they would be married under, okay? And so at this event that they would have under this chuppah, they would actually exchange rings, which is what we normally know is like, you know, a normal thing when people get engaged, the husband gives his wife a ring, right? But they both exchanged rings in this case. They also exchanged gifts. The ketubah was read aloud, okay? So the law, the law they'd established for the marriage contract was read. 
Here's what the husband agrees to do. Here's what the wife did. This is done. We are married. They are going to be married. But in, in doing this, I always like to double it because I've preached this before to my youth students and I wanted to go back and do more research. Turns out there were two blessings specifically that were prayed over the family at this event. One of them was a traditional blessing over the wine, just like we pray over food. God blesses food to our bodies. It was very traditional. But the other one was a warning. The other one was a blessing, but it included words of warning in there that they were to fear God, that they were to abstain from sex for at least one year. Like this was not like they don't live together at this point. They don't, they're not even together. As a matter of fact, we're going to see here that when they leave the chuppah, that the husband and the wife separate and go apart from each other for a while. Okay? But real quickly, just to kind of this chuppah and this event, Joel refers to this. Joel says this in Joel 2.16. He says, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. So they're called to this event. This event takes place. If you've ever seen um, some older movies that are about the Bible, occasionally you'll see somebody getting married and they're holding wine, they twist their arms together, they each drink from it. So wine was one of the things that was drank at this event. Now, at this event, one of the things that was given, there wasn't just the dowry, there wasn't just the promises, there wasn't just the ketubah, there was something called the matan. The matan was a gift, and it served three very specific purposes for the wife from her husband. And those three promises were this. A reminder of his love, that he was thinking of her, and lastly, that he would return for her. Okay? So something that reminded him of his love, that he was thinking of her, and that he would return for her. I'm hoping that some of you right now, the dots are all just kind of connecting in your head as you're hearing all this, because that's kind of the fun part for me in this. So now this betrothal period is called kidushin, and it means to sanctify or set apart. So during this time, there were things that would happen the groom would go back to his father's estate or house and he would start building an attached building to it for him and his wife to dwell in. This would be their home, okay? And the wife would prepare for marriage and would prepare her dress for her wedding day. Now, the groom would have, and the bride would have an idea of when they were gonna be married, but it wasn't specific. It wasn't one year from this day, you guys will be married. During this kiddushin, the father was the one who reserved the right to both observe the home and the dwelling and see that it was done and then tell his son when he could go get his bride. But also a rabbi had to oversee the building where it was built and know that it was better than the place that the bride had lived in before. So this home that the husband went to build had to be better than her dad's place. It's a lot of pressure on the husband and he doesn't even get to have sex with his wife for the first year. So he's doing all this. And as you can imagine, in modern culture, that kind of flies in the face of what we understand of some things and see people doing in life. So let's move on from that. So now the last step of the wedding tradition is called the neshuin. The neshuin means to carry or to carry off. So just take the imagery of a husband carrying his bride across the threshold. Like this is what this symbolizes, okay? And so this was a surprise. And if you look in, there's a parable in Matthew 24. There's a bunch of women who are waiting for the groom to show up. And they've got candles. And some of them collected their oil and were ready. And some of them did not. And they all fall asleep. And when they hear the sound of the shofar and it comes and the party's coming, five of them get up and they cut their wicks and they relight their lamps. And five of them say, give us some of your oil so that we may light ours. And they said, you weren't prepared and they run off. And then later on, when they show up late to the party, they're excluded because they were not prepared for when the groom would come, okay? So, at the Neshuan, the groom's party would sound a shofar and would announce the groom's coming from afar off. And the pinnacle of this whole marriage was that they would have a feast for seven days and have the marriage supper. And before we get into that, I actually was able to procure something kind of cool, which is cool because Sherry has a shofar and Parker is actually going to play it for us. And just so we can kind of hear what it would sound like. 
Behold, the groom has come. But here's, this is important. So I'll just leave you with that. Make it weird and let it go until we get to the end of the message. <laughs> so, when the shofar was heard, the groom's party would gather up people from the city, the whole city. This is, again, the background of what Adam talked about in that first week of Celebrate where they had this, the wedding feast and there's this wine. He says, you saved the best wine for last. The whole town was there. This is not like a, oh, we invited 10 of our friends or 20 of our friends or 50 or 100, but we had to cut out like 200 because we couldn't afford that kind of wedding. That would have been shameful. They had to have the whole town there because in Hebrew culture, the town that you were part of, the fellowship, the community you were part of, this was your family. Okay? So they would do this and they would march there and there was a whole celebration. And after it was over, there's one detail I'm going to leave out for the sake of PG for some people. But needless to say, after all this was done, the husband and wife would finally leave together and they would live in the full covenant of marriage. Okay? That's the Hebrew wedding tradition. Now, this is important because Paul tells us that we are the bride of Christ. Paul doesn't say something that means nothing, that is not Paul's nature. See, Paul, unlike all the other apostles, is a former Pharisee, which means he knows the Old Testament front to back. It's why he's the one that often, very much in the New Testament, explains the Old Testament to the Christians. Whereas Peter and them were unlearned men, as the Bible would call them in Acts, and say that they only knew what they knew from Jesus and from growing up Hebrew, Paul had no such issue. Paul knew the law front and back. He knew the details of the Old Testament. So I would imagine that when the Bible says he went out and spent three years in the wilderness learning from the Lord himself, that he was like all these light bulbs went off in his head of all the stuff he knew from the Old Testament and was like, oh my gosh, like just like blew his mind, right? Like just the understanding of who Messiah and who Christ is probably did that. I'm hoping that some of this will give you that today. So let's go real quickly to the first step. So we have the Shidokin, okay? We know that God chose us. The Father chose us before the foundation of the earth. Here's what it says in Hosea 2.19. It says this, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and, I shall, and you shall know the Lord um, if you go on the Blueprint Church app, I, we included a bunch more verses that I had for all this stuff. There is too many. We'd be here all day, and I'd bore some of you to death. But there is a lot. So if you want correlating verses, if you're like me and you want two or three witnesses to say what God said and see that it's true, it's there for you. I made sure to include it so that we included it in the app this week. But here's another verse. This is in um, 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12. This is Paul talking. He says, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul, here's a second witness, is telling us that we are betrothed to Jesus. Okay? Not only betrothed to Jesus, that he betrothed us to Jesus, but that God chose us before the foundation of the earth. You'll see that throughout the New Testament in Romans and Ephesians and Galatians. He will say this over and over, God chose you, God chose you, God chose you, God chose you, okay? Now, the ketubah. The ketubah is the new covenant, okay? So the groom promises to love and care for his bride. And Jesus did that by giving us a new heart, okay? So here's the, the verses from Ezekiel eleven nineteen. 19 says this, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Jesus, when he dies on the cross for us, he give, we, when we believe in him, we receive his spirit. We receive his heart, right? We've been given a new heart to obey him and to follow him. Okay, he's promised to take care of us. But here, there's more to that than just that, okay? So the groom promises to love his wife and care for her but also we have the choice as the bride to accept Christ. I will tell you here today, you can hear me talking. You have a choice, and it's an important one. It's either be married to the king of the universe and the one who created your soul, or don't. But don't complain about your marriage when it's not the same as being with Jesus. 
That's all I'm saying. So, and he promises, but this is actually from Acts 2.38, which was not in my original notes, but I include it. It says this. It says, if then God gave the same gift to them. Oh, wait, oh, that's not the right verse. My bad. My next verse was in Acts. Here it is. Go put that back up, Daniel. I'm sorry. Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a choice. He's imploring them, repent. What must we do to be saved? Repent. Okay? So we, as Christians, as the church, we have a choice. So next on this is the mohar. Okay? And the mohar was the bride price. Okay? Now God promised he would never divorce us. Okay, this is in Malachi, he says this. So he says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And he pays this bride price with his blood. That he gave his life for ours. Okay, now, this bride price is supposed to buy us back from our family, right? Now this bride price, this blood does not buy us from our parents. It doesn't buy my, me from, you know, my parents. It doesn't buy you from your parents, but it does buy you from your family spiritually, which is sin and death. Our family, according to God, if we are not walking with him, according to Jesus, I think it's in Matthew, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you do the works of the liar. So that is not our family until we follow Jesus. But his blood paid the price that we might be able to leave our family and be with him. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. He says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of, as a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus' perfect blood is the mohar, or the mohan, okay? Now, the mikvah. Now, this one's fun because Adam gave you three reasons the other week why he thinks that Jesus got baptized, and they were all correct. It looked like it was an example. There were so many things to fulfill righteousness. But might I add one more? That might be that the mikvah that he took place in was him being ritually immersed to entering the marriage with the church. This takes place before his ministry starts, before he starts to fulfill what God has sent him to do, he gets immersed first. That's the first thing he does is he goes and sees John. And when John asks him, shouldn't I be baptized by you? He says, let it be done to fulfill all righteousness. Well, for in order to be the righteousness of God, to wear our perfect wedding clothes, he has to do this too because we're getting married to him. And then when we become believers and we go to enter into this marriage contract, as we saw last week, we get baptized. So we've entered into our ritual immersion. He's entered into his ritual immersion. Now everything's ready for this betrothal to begin in earnest. So now the next part, we talked about the irusin. The irusin when we first take communion, we enter into that betrothal. So here's Matthew 26. This is what Jesus says. So they're getting, maybe you missed this part. Maybe you just kind of gloss over the last part after you hear the body and the blood, and we always do. It says, then he, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, I'm sorry, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27, he says, and then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Verse 20, or 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So before we go to the next verse, Daniel. So they, there's wine being shared. He's telling them what this is for. He's reading the marriage contract. Not only is he doing that, but there's body and blood. 
There was two blessings pronounced. One was over the wine, and one was what the fear of God and what it was for. And he's reading both of these by telling them, here's the blood, here's the wine. This is for us, this is for you. Here's my body, this is the remission of sins, this pays for all that. Because only a holy God could cleanse us of our sins. And only through his repentance and, all the, and for repentance and forgiveness could we have that. But now, in the last verse, he says this. He says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So, we're going to get this later when we talk about communion, but communion does not have to be somber. Because clearly, after it was done, they sang a hymn of praise. They were happy about something. But the disciples didn't really understand. It's not yet. Not yet, Josh. That, I'm going to repeat that at the end when we're doing communion. So that happens, okay? And so they go out and they sing after that. So we'll talk about that more when we get into communion. But last, so let's get to the next part. So the Kiddushin, okay? So the Kiddushin, Jesus is fulfilling his part of this process. So it says here, progressive sanctification. That's our current stage we're in. We get sanctified day by day, right? We become more and more like Christ. According to Revelation, we are making our clothes as white because of the blood of Christ and because of the work we do therefore, right? So we are being sanctified. We are preparing our wedding garments. Jesus says this, and here's another one in John. I love this because I, I hope you just, it didn't click or it didn't make sense, but now I hope it makes sense. He says this, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse two, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Let verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. They could not be together until that was fulfilled. Okay? They could not be together until the, a rabbi had seen the work they'd done. Now, we know that this same week that this is all going on, Jesus gets tested over and over and over and over. And they were playing out a part of what happens with the Lamb of Passover, that they were inspecting the perfect Lamb of God to see if he was perfect, and he was, and it made them frustrated. It made them frustrated because he was perfect. He was the Lamb of God. He was the Passover Lamb. So as this rabbi inspects Jesus this week, that this is all going on leading up to his death, he's perfect. He's better than where their previous place was and their previous family was. So here's what it says. That says that about the house. And then, of course, us sanctifying ourselves. Here's 2 Timothy 2.21. He says this. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So as Christians, as we grow more like Christ, we sanctify ourselves and we get ready for marriage. The last part here, well, it's the last two parts. So then at this giving, at this this time, ready, like we just, the wine and everything was done there for the Eurocene. We have the matan, the gift. There's something else in the Bible that's called a gift over and over and over. The Holy Spirit. But check this. The Holy Spirit is a gift and has a purpose. Now, the matan, from the husband to his bride, is to make him remember her, to let her remember her that she loves, her, that he loves her, and that he would come back for her. Okay? The gift. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So this is what Paul says about the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's the one I had in next. I'm sorry. I just changed that last minute. I apologize. So it says this. This is Peter. He says, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? He's talking about when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. He's calling the Holy Spirit a gift, but it has a purpose. And Jesus told us the purpose in John. And John, he says this. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, 
the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Verse 27. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. There's another part in John where he refers to the helper that he will call to remembrance everything I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit's job is a gift to remind us of Jesus. And it's a gift because it's also to remind us that he loves us. Because he gave us this gift that lets us walk in supernatural power. That lets us walk in in the ways that God has made for us. The paths that he has made for us. To walk through obstacles. They're not always the easiest to walk through, but the Holy Spirit usually provides guidance and leadership through those times. And even when it sucks and it hurts, and we're in a bad place, Jesus still loves you. And this is not the end. So then the last part, the Nishuin, the wedding supper of the Lamb. So in Matthew 24, 36, how many of you have ever been so confused why Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour that he's returning for them? Why that bothers us so much? Because we're like, well, if him and the Father are the same person, why doesn't he know? It's very specific. Because the day he returns is for his wedding. And that was resided only with the Father. Matthew 24 says it like this, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The coming of the bridegroom with a shout, the blowing of a horn, the wedding procession going to the bride's home. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. He says this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. By the way, the word that people always refer to as the, the um, not the resurrection, but the, the um, the rapture. Thank you. I'm so glad I said the rapture. The word rapture in Greek is harpazo. It means to snatch away or to carry off. Okay? Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together, Harpazo, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So they're snatched away. There's a party. There's a, the groom is coming. There's a shout. There's a horn. And they're taken away from where they were. But the best part is that in Revelation, we see this in 19, 7 through 9 the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is, this is the end. This is when we, the church, are with Christ, and it's over. Satan is done for. All of it's finished. And it says this, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Jesus did not miss a beat. Every single step of the process, he provided an answer or what he was going to do for it. He honored the entire wedding tradition, which is why Paul calls us the bride of Christ. And I guarantee people, even then in the first century, were like, what does that mean? I'm a dude. I'm not getting married to another dude. Like, it just was confusing to them. And yet, we're told by, by Jesus, when the, the, the Pharisees come and question him, they say, if this guy is married and then his, his, what, he, he dies, and then his brother marries his wife, and then that brother marries his wife, and they keep dying and, and marrying, which one's his husband? He said, they're not married in heaven because we're not married to our spouses on earth in heaven because we're married to Jesus. Like all these things that seem always kind of like you're curious, they're there and they're all answered. The problem is the Bible is like, God, the Hebrew style of literature is, is meant to be meditated on. It's meant to be read and pondered and said aloud. And you're supposed to go, what does this mean? I'm sure somebody's got an answer somewhere. And they go farther in the word of God and they find it. Like, it's not cryptic, but it's there. But it's not always easily accessible because we didn't grow up Hebrew. We're Gentiles, most of us here. Some of us may have some genetic link to Israel, but most of us are Gentiles. We did not grow up with Hebrew teaching. We did not grow up being parts of Israel. And yet, if we go to the Bible, we will get those answers. And the best part is it points to the perfection of Jesus and how good he is. 
So today, to end our celebration uh, series, we're going to take communion together. But I'm going to tell you that maybe today we don't take communion somberly. Yes, we should inspect ourselves. Yes, we should always make sure we have the right motives. But it's done for celebration because we're waiting on our groom to come back for us. So it shouldn't be taken lightly and be like, okay, um, I think I'm, I'm doing what Jesus told me to do and I'm honoring it. No, let's celebrate and be excited. What was it, Adam, you said a couple Christmases ago, you said, I'm just sick of trees. I'm just saved by grace. And they're walking out their head down. Pick your head up, man. We have the greatest husband ever. We have Jesus as our groom. We have eternity in front of us. And if you don't know Jesus, now's the time. Like, there's no time too late. The Father has already chose you, and he's still going, will you marry my son? He's asking all the time. If you don't know him, come to know him, please. Because a lot of us have seen what human bad marriages look like. Can you imagine a spiritually bad marriage looks like? So, we'll go back to Matthew 26, because we'll read this together. And as we do, the worship team will come back up now, Josh. <laughs> so the first thing is he said, is he said, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave thanks and he gave it to all of them and said, drink this for this is my blood. Given to, for the shed, for the remission of sin. Take the blood. He said, take this, this is my body, broken and beaten for you. But as we celebrate today, let's go with verse 30. They sang a hymn of praise as they left there. Let's praise Jesus today and give thanks for the groom that's coming for us once more.